Feast TV is brought to you with support by Missouri Wines, Whole Foods Market at Town & Country in the Galleria, and the Raphael Hotel. In this episode, we are going to explore what is growing this season here in the Midwest with visits to College of the Ozarks, Gilardi's and Urban Roots Farm, the folks at Boys Grow, and then also we're gonna meet up with Kitchen Culture here at the Schlafly Bottle Works in Maplewood, Missouri. I'm Kat Neville, and this is Feast TV. So in this episode, we are going to be highlighting products from two of the places that we actually had a chance to visit. One is the College of the Ozarks. They have these amazing stone ground grits. And then the second is Boys Grow in Kansas City, and they have created this avocado hot sauce. And so what else would showcase grits and hot sauce but shrimp and grits? And we're gonna be making a shrimp broth along with those cheesy grits. And then I'll show you how to saute and also devein the shrimp. So before we get started, let's actually head to the College of the Ozarks all the way down in the southern part of Missouri and see what their agriculture program is growing. So give me a snapshot of how all of this works at the university. It's such a unique program, the fact that the students don't pay any tuition and that they work in all aspects of the school essentially to, to fund their education. Um, during the school year, they work 15 hours a week for their education. Um, and then also during the summer, um, those of them who qualify work 40 hours a week to pay for their room and board and their meal program. So all the students here at the college work 15 hours a week. Um, and the dairy is one of the workstations. Here in, in, the, uh, in the ag department, we've got um, the dairy, um, a feed mill, um, a beef operation, hog farm. We also have a processing plant where we can um, process um, beef cattle or process um, hogs. So that's where the majority of, um, actually all of the pork that the Keter Center uses comes from here and is processed on our processing plant. It's the stone ground grits that come from our mill made in a polenta style with the pork sitting on top of that, topped with the tomatoes, and then we have a little bit of wilted arugula on top. You supply the Keter Center. You also have an actual open to the public market, is that right? Yes. Um, this shirt opens May 29th and it goes through October 30th. It's every Friday. Um, we actually start getting ready at 5 in the morning. Um, it opens at, at 7 in the morning and then um, it goes until 1230. Everything that we sell, I mean, gets reinvested, just like you said, back into the, the college. Um, so we start out with a, with a an operating budget, but everything we sell just gets rolled back in into the, into the college. And, and so the cream from this is from the dairy, the smoke hog jowl is from the, the pork operation, you're making pasta. the pasta, yep. and so you're, are you grinding the flour for the pasta here at the mill? Uh, yes. That's yep. amazing. What, do you, what is the most rewarding part of being, you know, integrated into this type of a program? Well, just seeing the students um, from when they get here. Some, we have a lot of students that have ag backgrounds, and, but we have a bunch that, that don't. And that we offer, we're a liberal arts institution, and so typically at a liberal arts institution, you don't necessarily see an ag program. And it's kind of at the, the heart of what we do here. At its heart, this is an academic institution, so all of these work programs kind of add to the experience of the students, what, that, what does that mean for them? That means that they can go into Mark Hubbard's um, horticulture classes or they can go into Tammy Holder's soil science classes and they can come out here and apply what they've learned. What I like is that they get to, to really get a big picture of what this all looks like. And it funds their education. And yes. that's what I think is so brilliant is that they're graduating without student debt yes. and they're learning and, and contributing to the economic health of the school at the same time. The aha moment for me was when we had an ag student say, you know, I grew up on a farm and you plant it, 
you nurture it, you water it, you give it sunlight, you let it grow, you grow it to the best that you can, you sell it, end of story. Now they're seeing what happens to it after it's sold and then goes to the table and a guest pays the real money for it and the satisfaction that the guest sees out of it. So they're seeing the full cycle that way and our culinary students are seeing it the full cycle the other way. We have students that come here and every student has to work um, 15 hours a week and we have plenty of jobs that they can choose from but some students they decide you know what we have a college dairy why don't I see what it's like working on a dairy and they come here and just uh, to show them the the farm experience and also educate on how to how to produce food in a safe um, economic and sustainable way. I think one of the most valuable parts of that integrated work program, besides the fact that the students are graduating debt free, is that they get such a breadth of experience. You might be a psychology or a nursing major, but then also learn how to run a farmer's market or milk a cow. And so we're going to get started with our shrimp and grits. I'm going to do all essentially of the mise en place before we move over to the stove and get started on the cooking portion. This right here is a bouquet garni. When you see this listed in a recipe, it is simply a bunch of herbs kind of tied together. And here I have um, thyme and sage, some basil, and also some fresh oregano. So I'm gonna set this over to the side for now. And I mentioned shrimp shells. These massive, gorgeous shrimp came um, with the shells on. They did not have the heads attached. And if you can find the shrimp with the heads attached, definitely throw that into your stock pot because they add a ton of flavor. But what I wanna show you is how to devein these shrimp. The easiest way is just to take a paring knife and gently run it down the back. Just kind of split this guy open and then you'll see the little intestine essentially will kind of pop out. It's not the most glamorous job deveining shrimp, but it is something that you'll want to do because you don't want to eat all that. So I'm going to go ahead and get through all of these shrimp. All of the shrimp have been deveined. So I'm going to finish up the rest of my mise en place. This red pepper and these two tomatoes are going to go into the shrimp. So I'm just going to chop those up right now. So I am going a little bit of an extra mile on this and making my own shrimp broth, shrimp stock. And the reason why I'm doing that really is just because of the flavor and also to make sure that I don't waste all of those shrimp shells, I'm using them instead of throwing them away. If you don't have the time or the inclination, you can use boxed fish stock or you could even use chicken stock if you wanted to. So here are the two plum tomatoes, one red pepper diced up and ready to go. And I'm gonna go ahead and, you know, just kind of mince up this garlic clove as well. My garlic is all minced. And the last little bit of prep work before I move over to the stove is just grating up some Parmigiano-Reggiano and a bunch of sharp cheddar cheese that is gonna be stirred into the grits. It's going to be decadent and delicious. Shrimp and grits is one of those classic Southern dishes that's making a comeback along with like fried chicken and all that kind of good stuff. And it's, uh, it's just a really fun thing to be able to make at home. So you don't need to watch me shred a bunch of cheese. So I tell you what, let's head to the Schlafly Bottleworks Farmer's Market in Maplewood, Missouri, and meet the folks behind Kitchen Culture. Now that I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, you know what? I, I was thinking. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm glad you're here. To have a food vendor at one of these farmers markets actually utilizing produce from the farmer stand that's right next door. You right. don't see that very often. This is our fourth year at the market. We started sourcing from the farmers and we kind of developed a relationship with these specific people because they actually happen to be our neighbors at the market. So we have two booths at the market. One is a breakfast sandwich booth and we offer people a fried egg. So we use Bobby's eggs 
And what's tremendous is a lot of her customers that take food home, they might have an experience with that food, but it's at home. So she's cut off from that. But we're cracking like sometimes 100 eggs a market on this grill. And the yolk is beautiful. It's like the prettiest orange you'll ever see. And those people go, wow, that's live springs. And then they go right to her. Our chickens are rotated to fresh grass every 48 hours on the farm, which results in tremendously nutritious eggs with a deep orange yolk and a, a white that stands up in an egg that you just thoroughly enjoy eating. I think it's really important for businesses like Kitchen Culture to be able to take our, um, our farm-produced products and then turn them into something that's really, really beautiful and, and convenient for customers too. And so what Kitchen Culture is able to do, they're able to source really good local sustainable products and then they're able to turn them into flavors and, and different combinations and stuff like that that the home cook may not be able to come up with themselves. On Saturday, what are you going to have on hand? So right now, Drew is just starting to have vegetables. They've been doing a lot of plants. We're still using a lot of his winter product. And then once the stuff comes in this year, like we'll grab his radishes, um, we'll, we'll use a lot of his squash. We'll definitely do a lot of his greens for sure. So basically, when we come to the farmer's market, we have a lot of produce to provide for people. Fresh picked uh, either that day or the day before or something. So at the end of the farmer's market, if we don't sell that to the customers, we provide that to Kitchen Culture. When I think that Kitchen Culture kind of puts a dish together for people to kind of open their minds a little bit to try something different. Uh, gives them an idea of different recipes they can try or to see that they don't just have to throw arugula in a salad. They can make a pesto out of it or take kale and make, you know, kimchi or any number of greens like bok choy and stuff. Uh, and it kind of, it kind of helps us in that way because people can now understand like the product that we have and they can figure out a better way to transform it to, I guess, expand their palate in the kitchen. There's such a romantic idea of coming to the farmer's market and shopping and getting kale and getting, you know, salad greens. But what you guys do is you show them what can be done with those products beyond that typical family right. meal that they're used right. to creating. I think you're right about the romantic notion. I think there are a lot of people who love going to the market. It's a social event as well as, you know, just functional like buying food. A lot of times they just don't know exactly what to do with the product. You know, I think I used the word elegant before. Maybe it's not quite that, but we're trying to take really classic, traditional cooking techniques and um, just nicer food than people are used to doing for themselves and then selling it to them. And then they feel like they're really treating themselves because they're supporting the farms, but they're also taking something home to their families that they feel really proud of. I've gone ahead and started our broth kind of simmering here. You want to raise the heat very gently and then kind of let everything simmer at a high rate for about 10 minutes and then bring it down to a really gentle simmer for, in the case of shrimp stock, roughly 30 minutes. With chicken stock, when I make it, I simmer it all day. That's a weekend project for me. Now, grits essentially are just ground up dried corn. And these were made by the students at the Lake of the Ozarks. So I'm really excited to cook them up. And just a little aside, my dad's family is from North Carolina and he's very, very particular about grits and will only eat the stone ground grits and takes chefs to task if they don't use stone ground grits, so this is for my dad. We have four tablespoons of butter, and I'm just gonna be adding in four cups of milk. You can use water if you really want to, but the milk is gonna make it a lot more creamy. And so it's gonna be four cups of liquid to one cup of the grits. So I'm just bringing this up to roughly a simmer. We're gonna melt the butter into the milk, and this is at roughly medium-high heat. The milk is now at a boil, and all of our butter is melted in. So I'm just gonna stream in a cup of the grits and stir it constantly until it comes back to the boil. Mm -hmm. 
and these should cook for roughly 25 to 30 minutes, but don't take that to be the law. You definitely want to make sure that they're tender. So stop and taste them, and if they aren't quite finished, then kind of let them keep going. And speaking of keeping going, I'm going to watch over these two pots while you go and visit Springfield, Missouri and meet the chef behind Gilardi's and his partnership with Urban Roots Farm. You know, I'm always looking for color. This is pretty interesting. What type of lettuce is that? That's the Cherokee head lettuce. Oh, I do have some sunflower shoots in the greenhouse. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Set right on top of the mm -hmm. salmon. That would be beautiful. Yeah. Uh, my name is James Martin. I'm the owner and chef at Gilardi's, even though my chef's coat does say head dishwasher. My name is Melissa Millsap, and I'm co-owner here at Urban Roots Farm. James. Finally made it. Sorry about that. No, I'm ready to get in the kitchen. Let's do it. Come on in. So you went out with Melissa. Yes. And picked a bunch of gorgeous stuff. So mm -hmm. what are you going to be making? Because we're going to do a wild line caught sockeye salmon. It's going to be set on a bed of quinoa that we're going to saute with that kale and Swiss chard uh, that we found out there in the garden. And then we're going to use the radishes as a raw component to the dish. We'll slice those, have those layered around the outside. I like having raw and cooked food together. So she had the farm in 2009. I purchased Gilardi's uh, that I worked at as a, as a kid when I was 22 years old um, in 2013. And immediately I had this idea of this local food sourcing from urban, you know, from local farms. And Melissa and I had already had a friendship. So I immediately came to Melissa and said, okay, let's start developing a relationship uh, of what you're growing and how seasonality is going to affect my menu and things like that. And I think that's kind of how it just kind of started. It seems to be a worldwide movement of people wanting to know where their food's coming from and things like that. So The local food movement is not just in these big cities. It's something that is very much becoming just part of what it means to eat in America. Absolutely. First and foremost, we talked about seasonality, what is growing. Not having my food force the issue of strawberries in December. And so I'm always going to look for things that are perfectly in season. For example, your root vegetables, uh, we picked out uh, the, the radishes. Those are going to be lovely this time of year. They've got a lot of sugar content to them, and they're, they're just going to taste better in general. Yeah, that's perfect. Those are beautiful. Oh, it tastes so good this time of year, too. To me, my goal is to grow high-quality food right in the place where people live, work, and play. It's really important for us to work with high-quality chefs like James as well because we have a lot of the same clientele. And so if they can come here and they can get the fresh food, they can take it home and prepare it in their kitchens, but then they can go to a wonderful restaurant and experience it at a whole different level, it's just a full circle, I think. With restaurants like Gilardi's that can actually being in the face of those customers and explaining those seasons to them. They're really doing the work of reaching the community and we're doing the work of talking to the restaurants and saying, you know what, these three months I can grow you lettuce. These three months I'm going to grow you arugula. I think one of the biggest things that is driving people to question where their food comes from is the fact that we've gotten so far away of what food is. It's our food and it's our water. So as a community, we're taking back the power that we have lost over the last couple decades. It's our food, it's our water, it's our community. I do have these wonderful arugula flowers. These you here. never see, unless you're gonna go to a farmer's market, you will never see something like an arugula flower available. Okay. That is late spring on a Isn't plate. That beautiful? It's gorgeous. Well, Kat, it was really nice to have you into Gilardi's Kitchen. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. It was so fun to see you and Melissa take everything from farm to this kitchen and to the plate. So thank you. You're welcome. It's a weekly endeavor. And I'm very, very excited to see what the next 10 years bring us. Me too. We'll be watching. Thank you, Kat. So our grits are thick and rich. 
One thing that I didn't mention before we took that trip to Springfield is keep some water on hand because as it cooks, it will thicken up and you'll want to thin that out. And now I am going to add in a bunch of sharp cheddar cheese and Parmigiano Reggiano. I mean, this is just gonna be so delicious. Once you have all the cheese incorporated, you just wanna keep this on warm. You don't wanna let it get too cool because it'll coagulate. So I just put it on super duper low and I'm gonna cover it while I cook the shrimp. The first step in making the shrimp for the shrimp and grits is to brown the andouille sausage and render out all of the fat. Now, you can use bacon if you really want to use bacon, but all of the spicing in the andouille is really gonna add depth of flavor to the overall dish. Okay. Our andouille is sufficiently browned, and now I'm adding in just those two chopped up garlic cloves, and I'm gonna stir it just until it's fragrant, so like 30 seconds. And then in will go those big, beautiful shrimp. I'm gonna saute these just until they're pink, not until they're cooked all the way through because I'm gonna take them out and then put them back in. So just until they're barely pink. Next up, now that I've incorporated the shrimp, are that red pepper and those two plum tomatoes. The shrimp are nice and pink. So I'm gonna go ahead and ladle this out for now and just move on to the next step of the recipe, which is adding in that shrimp stock that we made. The next step is to add in roughly a cup of that shrimp stock. I'm gonna bring that to the boil and then reduce the heat back down to low and then add in four tablespoons of butter. Now that all that butter has been added to our shrimp stock sauce, we're gonna put all of this gorgeous shrimp back in along with a couple handfuls of green onions. When we come back from this next segment, I'm going to have all of the elements of the dish put together and I'm going to pair it with our wine, a Chardonnay from Les Bourgeois. So in the meantime, let's head to Kansas City and meet the gentlemen that are behind a fantastic nonprofit there called Boys Grow. I started Boys Grow in 2010. I was working in Northern California for a foster care system and I had one kid in particular that was shipped out to the country and he got to go work on a kind of a small functional farm and he just loved it. So the responsibility of taking care of his goat that he had, the uh, small garden plot that he had, he just he loved being a part of that system. So it was my idea to create a, uh, a system similar to what he experienced on that foster family. And how long is their experience? Is it just one season or do they get to come back? Yeah, it's, it's a two year program. Okay. So and that's one thing that, um, that we stress initially because the things you're gonna do here, we can't teach you these things overnight. And we need to know that you're going to be invested in this. You're going to be a part of it. If we could, if we could take them for six to ten, we would. But the reality is, we take them for two, and then hopefully all the skills and traits and knowledge and mentorship and all that stuff they get thrown at them within two years, they can carry on the rest of their life. Uh, well, first we come in, we do our bucket check, see what we all have. Then they'll split us up into our groups. Me and Brian are part of the culinary crew. There's agricultural. There is, you can finish that off for there's me. There's construction, there's marketing, there's public speaking. And then there's a design team. We're digging a hole in preparation of Howard Hanna's dinner at our farm uh, next Sunday. We are going to roast a pig so that we can have it for our dinner. The dinner is, it's like a fundraiser dinner for us. So all the money goes to the boyfriend. Almost like a charity. I met John in 2011 and he pulled into the parking lot of the restaurant, came in with, I think he had a whole bunch of cabbage the first time we talked and um, they had it in, uh, in five gallon buckets and uh, I didn't know who they were or what they were doing and um, right away I kind of got the sense that it was sort of some sort of mentorship program and that the boys were the ones that did the talking and I, I loved the way he interacted with them, that they were you know, trying to sell produce to a restaurant but at the same time 
he would say things to them like, you know, make sure you look him in the eye, make sure you shake hands firmly. And, you know, I could tell he was teaching them how to navigate different parts of the world, not just, you know, the agricultural side of it that they do here on the farm. What I think is so brilliant about this particular program is it's not just getting kids out onto a farm to learn how to grow tomatoes and cucumbers, but you take them through the life cycle of creating a product, learning how to market the product. When do you decide what product you're gonna make and then do the crops that you grow? Is that based on that or is it, how does that work? It's always exciting every year, you know, I mean, when you're, these kids are young and they have the opportunity and the responsibility to come up with a product, sometimes a little overwhelming for them. So we have to kind of assist them and guide them in different directions. But at the end of the day, usually we chisel it down to about three products and then they'll vote on all three of them. And then whoever, whatever gets the most vote, that's the product that, that flies. And this year it is? This year we're doing a tzatziki salad dressing. We're at Hy-Vee, Whole Foods, mom and pop stores. It's pretty much all over the place. Like, <laughs> I'll walk past it and I'll look to the right like, hey, I made that. I'll be so happy about myself and people will walk past and look at it. And there's a button there that will tell our history of Boys Grow, and they'll look at it and they'll usually buy it. it it's very heart lifting. It's great. It's just like, I come across it one day and I just be like, hey, I did that. And then it's just, it's just great. I really think Boys Grow probably is life changing for just about any of them that would go through the program. And I don't think the expectation is that they go out and start a farm when they get out of school or that they want to be a chef and own a restaurant. I think that growing food and raising food and, and selling it and learning how it's how it's treated with, you know, and served to people is all a teaching tool to show them things about life. It's almost like family here. Uh, we, we both know each other on an intellectual level. We are almost like brothers to each other. I hope it'll last together forever. I mean, I'm still here and I graduated this year, matter of fact. I'll keep coming back. Pride, commitment, respect, boys go! Woo! Here are the shrimp and grits, and I really love that we've been able to incorporate grits from College of the Ozarks, and obviously you have to have hot sauce with shrimp and grits, and the folks over at Boys Grow, as you know, they make a different product every year, and this year is that tzatziki uh, salad dressing, but last year it was this avocado hot sauce, so we're going to sprinkle that on top. The shrimp and grits should be served with lemon wedges so that you have a little bit of acidity and we're also going to sprinkle on just a little bit of parsley. Now I'm pairing our shrimp and grits with a chardonnay from Les Bourgeois which is near Columbia in the middle of Missouri and Les Bourgeois is known for some of its more classic mid-state varietals like chardonnay. One of its parent grapes, it's a hybrid, is chardonnay and so it shares many of those characteristics it has a nice kind of apple and pear flavor, and then also has something of that round, kind of buttery mouthfeel that you'll find in those Chardonnays. And it's gonna go beautifully with the cheesy grits and this spicy, smoky, delicious shrimp. So cheers, and I'll see you next time.